can only imagine when that day comes. Good morning, brethren. Come right in. There's still a couple of chairs left, looks like. I'm glad to see each of you this morning. I hope you're glad to be here, and I especially hope you're glad to be here after you've been here for an hour or so. That's what, what tells the story. You know, this Bible reads a lot better when you don't have it upside down. When Psalm 38 had come to the passage, verses 9 through 14, I like to break down uh, passages into thought units and, uh, and proceed that way. Those of you that have been here know that. Okay, here it is. Well, we're not having to use any firewood out on 350 North, and I bet you're not either. And I'm not even going to gather any right now. Uh, but it, I have observed in the 36, 37 years that we've lived in Texas, it gets hot every summer. Y'all notice that? People talk like that's, you know, I mean, it is hot, but they talk like the world's coming to an end. Like, well, it's, it's been doing that since Buck's calf, summertime. Let's have a word of prayer as we begin. Lord, we're thankful for the day and for the opportunity that we have to come together. We pray that you would be with us in this period of study as we consider the lament of the psalmist and uh, appreciate the way he was honest in your presence. May we take a lesson from him in that respect and may we be edified together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to read the passage. We read it last time, but it was right at the end, and, and then we'll work through it. Um, as you can see, uh, he began this lament psalm with, Rebuke me not. Uh, he's, he's come to the realization he's really st stepped off in it, if you will, and um, dis discusses in verses 2 through 8 the, the oppression that he feels that he's brought down upon himself. And what I love about the psalmist is he he doesn't play um, doesn't play around with that. He owns his part of it and comes to the Lord because there's nowhere else to go. And at the end of the day, you know that that's true for all of us, isn't it? We're um, in trouble, particularly in trouble that we brought upon ourselves. Who are you going to go to? But to the Lord. And so he says, Lord, all my desires before you. And my sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs, my strength fails me, and the light of my eyes that has gone before me. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague, and my kinsmen stand afar off. Those who seek my life lay snares for me, and those who seek to injure me have threatened destruction, and they devise treachery all day long. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear. And am, I am like a mute man who does not open his mouth. Yes, I'm like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth are no arguments. He's just going to be quiet. You know, that's a thought sometimes. It's, I have the, the, I'm familiar with the old saying, and I'm sure you are too, where if you, you know, if you dug yourself into a hole, well, quit first thing, quit digging. Don't keep digging. And uh, it's the same way sometimes with a, uh, problems like what he's facing is it, it, uh, don't keep talking. Uh, just be quiet. My son told me one time, uh, uh, he said, Dad, I don't expect you ever to be in this situation, but if you ever do get in uh, some kind of a, um, a problem with law enforcement, don't say anything because he knows me. And he said, not, not a word, you know. Don't say anything until you have somebody there. Well, in verse 10, he's exhausted physically, mentally, emotionally. He's, just, he's wrecked spiritually. He is drained by the trauma of, of whatever this is. It appears that there's a, a, a sickness element to it. It says, my heart throbs, my strength fails me, the light of my eyes, even that has gone from me. And he's been left. Uh, he, he's been left spent, panting, half blinded, and helpless. The, he said, "The light of my eyes are gone. 
And it's, it's as if he's died and his eyes can no longer see and they stare out into open space, you know, that fixed uh, glare that sometimes happens when people pass. In verse 11, amazingly, those around him are not sympathetic to his condition. I, I don't mean his adversaries and his enemies. I'm talking about the folks that you would normally ex expect to be able to, to lean upon, your own people. And they're not, he says, my loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague and my kinsmen stand afar off. That's a bad spot, a really bad spot. And who's he got left to go to? The Lord. That, uh, that's, uh, he's in the right place. He's made the right decision there. But when he needs them most, they've turned away from him. And his friends have deserted him. Uh, perhaps thinking that he's smitten of God and that whatever this is could infect them as well. You know, uh, with all of the, the stuff the government said during uh, the pandemic, and they didn't know, they just sort of said stuff, uh, it appears to me, uh, that got folks scared up, what, didn't it? And uh, afraid to, to be together and... Uh, one of the really sad things is the people had to die alone in the hospital that did have family that cared about them. And, uh, and because we didn't understand the nature of the virus and what have you, uh, they locked it down, tried to keep it from spreading. I understand that, but that's a tough place to be. In this case, they've just, they've deserted him. And even his cherished relatives are keeping their distance from him. Uh, you don't have... I remember Brother uh, Woodson. He was the chairman of the Bible department when I was at Freed Hardeman. And he said, boys, if you have three friends that wouldn't desert you and that will always be there, if you have three in your life, you've been much blessed. And his, his point was being made was you got lots of acquaintances, but you don't have many friends. And some of these people that the psalmist is talking about, they may not have been real friends to begin with. I don't know. Uh, but here we have the situation and men do not and cannot understand um, all of these kinds of circumstances. But God understands it. Uh, and, and he can and he will be sympathetic. And apparently the, the writer hasn't attempted to explain his situation to others. Uh, he's brought this desperate predicament to the only one that can do something about it. That's a good policy too, isn't it? You know, uh, you have people, unfortunately, because I think it's an indication of a deeper psychological need, but you have people that appear to enjoy bad health. And if you ask them how they're doing, they're, oh, you know, it, it, well, that's a bummer. That's, that, that, that lets you down. It's, it's, you know, if somebody asks you how you're doing, don't lie to them, but you don't have to give them all the labs and show them the incisions. And You know how many incisions I've looked at in about 48 years of preaching and teaching? I've seen enough. <laughs> you know, it doesn't shake me up, but there are, are people that wouldn't dare show you their stitches, and there are people that just... And they're trying to cope with it. Well, he said that he didn't do that. He just was quiet. And he took it to the Lord in prayer. Verse 12, his sin has provided an occasion for the enemies to try to destroy him. So he got into this, as we've seen, because he brought it down on himself, whatever it was. And he says, those who seek my life lay snares for me. Uh, if this is David, which I believe it probably is, you know, being the king, there he's, he's always at risk. I mean, that's not a new problem. There's a reason that we spend, you and I spend millions of dollars every year trying to protect whomever is the occupant, occupant of the White House. Because every radical and, and um, deranged person in the world is committed to trying to do him harm. And uh, as I say, that's not a new phenomenon. King, the King David uh, faced you know, a lot of attempts on his life. And, and you just 
hear them, you know, among themselves. Have you heard that David is sick? This would be a good time to mount a strike. This would be a good time to come against him. While his mind is on his illness, let's put a plan together and, uh, and let, let's march. Well, maybe time to, to do its deadly work is here, you know. Maybe they'd already set in motion uh, some sort of an ambush or an attack. Additionally, his friends are shunning him because they regard him as being under God's judgment. And so, uh, you know, when you're dealing with a person, particularly when they get to the point that they're penitent, what, do we, what I always tell you about somebody that's wanting to repent, let them. If they want to repent, let them. You know, that's, that's the goal, isn't it? If somebody's out there and they're really, I mean, I'm talking about an error. I'm not talking about a little difference of opinion squabs that we have all the time. Uh, but they've fallen into a sin problem and they want to try to make it right. Let's let them do that. You know, that's not the time. If, if I were David's friend or a counselor for the king, you know, I, I don't, it wouldn't be the time to go in there and say, well, you brought it on yourself. He's already said that. So we're past that. This is not time to rub salt in the wound and try to inflict some, you know, some kind of morbid satisfaction that, you know, uh, that you brought this down on yourself and I'm mighty happy, you know. And so he can summarize the evil uh, designs of his adversaries, or he does. He says, those who seek to injure me have threatened destruction and they devise treachery all the day long. Uh, you know, you deal with that with humanity. There are folks that work a lot harder at getting out of work, and then there are folks that work a lot harder at, uh, at meanness than it would be to just go ahead and get on and slip. I mean, they are ingenious. If, if uh, you ever get on the other side, you know, with um, law enforcement and you're trying to work with some show enough outlaws, they're not dumb. Their lackeys are dumb, but the guy at the top of that is just sharp as he can be. And, and uh, David's dealing with national level adversaries. And so aware of his, his incapacity, they're rejoicing over his humiliation and are working to use that to accomplish their godless schemes and, and, uh, and things that they want to put into motion. In verse 13, when it comes to defending what he has done, He's chosen to just be meek and quiet. He's not going to do that. You know, sometimes when people are in a thing uh, that's a sin problem. They've entered into it. And obviously what needs to happen before God is they, need, they just need to repent and turn away from it. But repentance is a hard place to get sometimes. What do we tend to do? What's a natural I guess, or unnatural reaction that most everybody has. Well, so-and-so did this, you know, or something like that, or it, it wasn't my fault. Well, if you said it or you did it, it's your fault. I'm sorry. You know, I, and, and I hate getting, I hate being the guy that's in that place and come to the realization that I did it and it's my fault. But we've all been there and, likelier to be there again. It, it's hard work trying to take every thought captive to the, uh, unto the Lord, right? That's not easy because there's so many distractors out there. There's so many uh, temptations out there uh, to get into something that you don't need to be involved in. And our adversary is very good at what he does or very effective at what he does. I shouldn't say he's good. He's not anything good about it. But wherever your weakness is, he's going to see to it that that's up, up before you from time to time. And uh, we have to just kind of gear ourselves for that. Uh, here, David's in a position, he, cannot, he can't plead his integrity. And he can't say that he's been misunderstood. He doesn't have any plausible arguments uh, with which to defend his actions and his decisions. He can't exonerate himself with any explanations or alibis. So what can a guilty man say? 
What, what should he say? Well, he shouldn't say anything at that point. Uh, he's, he's fessed up. He's owned it. And that's all you can do. And so he's deaf and dumb before all the evidence. You know, um, it's in, I think in the legal system, they call it just like a no contest play. Uh, and it's, not, it's more than that because he's admitted in this psalm that, that he's the guilty party. Now he comes to a more positive turn in verses 15 through 20. He said, but my hope's in you. His hope's never been in himself. It's in the Lord. For I hope in you, O Lord. You will answer, O Lord my God. For I said, may they not rejoice over me. Who, when my foot slips, would magnify themselves against me? For I am ready to fall, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I confess my iniquity. I am full of anxiety because of my sin. My enemies are vigorous and strong, and many are those who hate me wrongfully, and those who repay evil for good. They oppose me because I follow what is good. That last point, I think, bears stressing in the situation where we find ourselves. Christians are going to have to gear up to the idea and accept the idea that there are people out there that do not like us. They don't like you because you're good. You are a living rebuke to a lot of the filth and vulgarity that's on display out in the world. You don't have to say anything. Just be who you are. Now, the response to that is not to quit being who you are, is it? I mean, the light will go out completely if God's people do not function as the light in the city set on a hill. The world needs God's people, whether they know it or not. They don't know it, but they do. In verse 15, even though he is depressed by his sickness and his sin, he hasn't lost his belief in the Lord or his faith in the Lord. I hope in you, O Lord, you will answer, O oh my God, he prays. He knows that redemption is in one place, one person, and that's in the Lord. And the only hope that, that continues when all other hope is gone is the hope that one has in the Lord. No situation is hopeless unless one turns away from God. Then you get to a hopeless situation. Because he is the source of all hope. And so the writer believes that God, through his loving kindness, is going to come to his aid. You know, he's, he's broken. Uh, he's a sinner. As are we all. Uh, Paul in Romans chapter 7, you, if you go back and read that passage, uh, is struggling. I don't know with what, but he's just struggling. And uh, he gets very honest with God and God's people when he says, you know, I, there's this war goes on in my members and what I don't want to do, I see myself doing and what I do want to do, I don't do. You know, who, who will help me, this wretched man that I am? And of course, he's throwing that to the Lord. That's what we should do in those circumstances. Aware that his enemies, in verse 16, are wanting to capitalize on his sin, on his folly, he mentions his feelings to God in prayer. He says, For I said, May they not rejoice over me, who, when my foot slips, would magnify themselves against me. Uh, they're just waiting for an opportunity to celebrate his downfall. Uh, I don't know how, what your life has been, um, but... Um, there are, unfortunately, there are people that take that kind of a, of attack. And um, it's the way they approach life. And, and uh, it, it's always sad. I, when I was in Huntsville and Greg, uh, young man Greg Wright, that I studied with a long time, was executed. Well, he was guilty. It appears, at least state said he was, and, and jury found him guilty. And state executed him. But I tell you what, when you see a 46-year-old man 
uh, that's built like Hercules and, and know him to be a bright, sharp, sharp guy, put down. That's still sad. And in that long old hallway down at the end, there he was. I spent the last two hours with him that he's alive on this earth. What do you say to a man in that situation? Uh, it it's a sad, sad thing to see. And I was struck by the fact, and I, it shouldn't have surprised me, but, you know, nobody on the staff, none of the guards, nobody that, that participated in that was having a fun day. It was a very somber occasion. And somebody said, well, the guy's guilty. Yeah, he's guilty. And, of course, anybody that works in the system figures out pretty quick, we're all guilty and uh, maybe not the same kinds of things exactly but things that are offensive to the Lord he aspires that David does to have a righteous heart before God he has kept himself from making the, the greatest mistake that of not returning to the Lord you know the thing to do when a man finds himself where he was is to turn that's, that's a key element in repentance and you don't have to repent toward me or I, you, but we want to get real and honest with God because he knows already. You know, we sometimes in prayer, and it's just because our human weakness and limitation, but we'll tell God where stuff is and, and <laughs> you know, and all that. And sometimes I get to think, well, he knows. He already knows. Um, but we speak to him as if we do our father, which he is. But on, on a scale, it's just, it's just unbelievable. But he, he hadn't made the mistake of abandoning the Lord. But draggled and broken and battered, he lifts his eyes to heaven, believing that God's never going to give up on a penitent sinner. And that's what we prayed over there that day at the Walsh Unit. And I got a little screen there. I never was able to shake Greg's hand. I regret that. Put our hands together and scream between us and pray. Uh, sad thing to see a man put, him in, put himself on that gurney. Verse 19, confident there that there are many who are against him. He just trembles at their strength and their numbers. You know, he said, but my enemies are vigorous and strong and many are those who hate me wrongfully. You know, when I was working some with Brother Buster Dobbs and we were trying to call attention to some matters uh, and to some people in the brotherhood who were, who were and are still teaching things that are contrary to the doctrine which is in this book, not everybody liked that. A lot of them didn't like it. And... Um, and so you, you, if you speak truth, period, full stop, if you are committed to speak the truth, you're going to have some enemies. No matter how right you are, no matter uh, how clean your motivations are and your, your attitude is, it can be pristine and it's still going to draw some, some difficulty. His foes hate him wrongfully or falsely. They don't have any valid basis for it, but they hate him anyway. And some have had no reason at all to hate him. And some of them hated him for all the wrong reasons. And so the, the basis of, of their hatred and their malice is um, not tenable. It's not valid. In verse 20, even those who should be helping him you know, that he ought to be able to rely on have turned against him. And those who, those who repay evil for good, they oppose me because I follow what's good. Well, I understand that. And, um, you know, you just got to buck up because the truth's important. We're going to be judged on the basis of what that says. And so it's important to, to get it right. Of all things, some people even hate him 
for his commitment to doing what is good. He's been good to some of them, but they've renounced him, understanding with his enemies. You know, uh, when you get into some of these things, you'll eventually end up with people on both sides shooting at you. There was a brother, uh, Norman Starling, who was the elder in the church and his longtime uh, Bible chair director down at San Marcos, worked with young people for a lot of years, it was very effective, had a very effective ministry. But uh, Brother Norman, back during what's called the Annie Movement, and brethren were at odds with one another about whether or not you could support an orphan's home, how many cups you have to have, you know, just a number of things, came up and got kicked around with Norman, um, and, and brethren drew drew their you know back and uh, built walls among themselves. Well, Norman kept the lines of communication open. He spoke to brethren on both sides of that. Well, how do you think that sat with the uh, some of the protagonists on both sides? Well, they got all got mad at Norman. Uh, he was a good man because he was going to do what was, what was right, whether it's popular or not. And there are not many guys that will do that and tell you the truth in that way. And we celebrate them. Um, in his loneliness, and David's loneliness, he finds himself without self-respect, without friends, and worst of all, without a right relationship with the Lord. And so he's trying to get back to that point. I really appreciate these psalms. I appreciate the candor of the, the people, uh, David and others that wrote them. In verses 21 and 22, Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, do not be far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation. So he's in the right place, talking to the right person in the right way. Verse 21, having led up to this focal point for this whole psalm, he makes his main plea. His urgent request. He's given his confession. He's expressed his penitence with, uh, without any equivocation, any excuse basing, making whatsoever. Now he's come to his appeal, and the brightest part of the psalm is where he pleads, Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, do not be far from me. O Lord and O my God suggest a, a tender appreciation for Jehovah. And um, understanding God's gracious nature, he doesn't hesitate to ask him to intervene on his behalf to make him clean. He, does, he talks to him because who's our father? Today's father. Who's our ultimate? Who's the father? God is. You know, and... My, I was a lucky man in the fact that I had an earthly father I could talk to about anything, period. And, um, you know, that, what a blessing. He's been gone a long time. And I'd give uh, everything I own to hug his neck one more time and have one more good long talk. I love my father-in-law. Now, he was a different kind God had different experiences, but they were out of that World War II generation. And I wish we had some more of them today. God does not hear us because we're beautiful. He doesn't hear us because of our beautiful, well-chosen words. He doesn't do that. That's not why uh, he hears us. He hears us because we're his. He listens as all good fathers do because of our integrity of heart and our sincerity of soul. He knows that. He knows if I'm equivocating. He knows if I'm trying to play games. And so if I come to him with an open heart and in honesty, the writer spent almost the entirety of the psalm establishing his contrition of heart. And now in just in a simple sentence, he makes his full petition and he begs the Lord God to come near to him. If God remains aloof and far removed, he knows that he doesn't, he's, he's out of hope. And uh, when people lose hope, 
they die. Verse 22, because of his dire necessity, he wants the Lord to act quickly in his behalf. Uh, his prayer is not specific. Help, come to my rescue, is really the basic content of what he prays. And he leaves the how and the precise when up to the Lord, but he, he's urgent in his own mind. And he asks the God of his salvation to save him. And as a, as a person who is in God's covenant, we talk about the old covenant, we know that we are not subject to that like they was, but he was a child of the covenant. And that is um, equivalent to a child of God in the Christian age. Indeed, he has sinned horribly. His life has become a disaster as a result of that. And uh, gripping his body and spirit is the chastisement of God. And in learning and taking the lesson that has come to him from these things, he repents, confesses to the Lord, prays for God's salvation. The non-Christian can't cannot come to God in this type of penitent prayer. He must first become a child of God. He must first be in covenant with the Lord. One cannot live the life of God until he enters it. However, for the wayward child of the Lord, for the wayward son or daughter of the Lord, this approach, repentance, confession, and prayer, that's the golden road back to where you belong, back home to his, his majesty. That's Psalm 38. That's Brother Herschel. Now, when we look at, at the idea of uh, earthly as opposed to spiritual, we talk about things like bread and water. God is able to work on all of us. In fact, because of who you belong. Right. Right. And and a lot of it is still falling out on us. What he did, but Joe. Yeah, the Lord was, he was seeking to communicate. And that's right. He, he was, uh, he could be very direct, very plain. And Brother Dow Flat was New Testament professor when I was at Fred Horman. He was a Tennessee hillbilly. I mean, really, way on back in the hills. And um, uh, he would talk about, uh, about things in simple terms. You know, and he had a, a THD degree from Baptist uh, seminary in New Orleans, which is, that's pretty high cotton academically. But what Brother Dow always worked toward was saying it simply and profoundly. Remember Brother Buster one time saying that over the years he had learned that there is profundity in simplicity. You know, A squared plus B squared plus C squared, you know, uh, Pythagorean theorem is that's pretty simple to say, but 
know, we don't understand all the implications of that yet. And and so I know it goes, but yes. Uh, and hope. I mean, I, I've watched it with patience and what have you. If, my, if a guy quits hoping, he's going to die. Uh, you know, you got to get that head turned around. There was a brother here years ago that had the first bypass at the new cardiac unit at Lufkin. And he was scared. And I remember a couple of us went over there to be with him, and he was he was really nervous. And so it was taking a little time. We were trying to encourage him, get him to, to come on, perk up, and assure him that he's getting good care, and he was. But a couple of doctors were just standing around. I went out at one point and left the brother with him and, and apologized, and the doctor said, oh, no, oh, no, if you guys can get him in a better frame of mind, we don't want to open him up where he is now you know we've got to give him another frame of mind so you know something about that uh, and so uh, you know, indeed uh, it, and I mean on a practical level hope's important and the real hope is in the Lord uh, this is all transient if I make it to my birthday I'll be 69 years old and, uh, and I'm thankful for the robust health that I've enjoyed and, and all of that. But, you know, i got enough sense to know that I'm not going to be here 69 more years. You know, that's not going to happen. And, and like Herschel said, God imposed the death penalty on humanity for defying him. Uh, but we, want, we have a hope in Christ. And that will sustain you um, Trust me, it will sustain you through everything. But you gotta you you gotta make the decision and continue to live with him. You come to Psalm 39, and this is like it's a companion to 38. The theme of it is God and the meaning of life. Um, when you look at the superscription, it's for the choir director, for Jeduthun, uh, a psalm of David. Uh, this man along with Heman or Haman and Asaph uh, is mentioned in the Old Testament as one of the directors of the temple music in 1 Chronicles 16, 41 and in 1 Chronicles 25 in verse 1. And he may have been the man that Ethan referred to in 1 Chronicles 15, 17. Well, that's just uh, observation. This psalm centering on the complexities of life um, is an individual lament, as I've said, possibly a sequel to 38. The riddles of life are not, not confronted by the writer with a big, uh, long philosophical discussion. Uh, they are they're dealt with in connection with his personal experience with a life-threatening illness and the chastisement for a sin. So it has some similar content. People have been getting themselves into trouble for a long, long time. And I think about a philosophical discussion. I remember when I was in graduate school, we had to read a, read a fellow from, a Danish fellow, and uh, had, had to read the book and come back ready the next week to discuss it with a professor. I didn't know better then. And so he said, well, what did you think about this, this writer, so I think he's a nut. That really wasn't what the professor wanted to hear. The professor, <laughs> professor, professor really liked this guy, but but I mean, he, his sentences were so convoluted and so complex uh, that it was hard. I mean, he had some good thoughts, but it was just hard to get a hold of it because of the way it was put together. You know, if this and that, and you know, and he just get into all throw a comma and keep going. You know, uh, sentences that long. I mean it. It just almost impossible to read, and that doesn't make it profound. Say, Jesus said things like, "All things whatsoever you would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them." For this is the law and the prophets. That's real simple. You know, you're the light of the world. A city that set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men uh, uh, light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a lampstand it gives light into all the house. You know, let, let the world see your good works and glorify the, the Father. It, it just on and on and on. Uh, so there are 
complexities to life. The exact time or occasion of the, of the writing is unknown. Uh, the writer looks back on a time when he was troubled by three things. The fleeting nature of life. Uh, the prosperity of the wicked. And the seeming purposelessness of the human life. You know, when you look, I mean, what is it all about? Is it about the kind of stuff, you know, going around uh, today that we see on the Internet? You know, is it about all the TikTok silliness and, and you know, or... Uh, people doing crazy junk. Is that what it's about? Uh, and, you know, just a lot of distractors out there. And then the fleeting nature of human life. You know, uh, as our family knows very painfully, you know, uh, life is, and I've known that all my life. That's the reason I encourage brethren. Love your people while you have them. Because someday, the family's going to be walking away from a new-made grave. So leave no loving words unsaid, no kindness undone when it comes time to say goodbye. The writer looks back on that, and, and perhaps, uh, perhaps he's languishing in poor health and believes that he is nearing the end of his earthly journey. And so he's faced these tough mental struggles with his faith in God. And by experiencing the discipline of God, he's come to see the true meaning of life. We'll begin, and, and, and he attempts, first of all, to just be quiet. He's just overwhelmed. Psalm 39, 1 to 3. I said, I will guard my ways I will not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle. While the wicked are in my presence, I was uh, while the wicked are in my presence, I was mute and silent. I refrained even from good, and my sorrow grew worse. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. So the writer tells how he's made a resolve deep, deep within his soul that I'm going to guard my ways that I might not sin with my tongue. Well, that's pretty good policy. You go over to the book of James and, and uh, he talks about how unruly the tongue is, like a wild pony. Uh, and so he makes the commitment to watch carefully his behavior and his speech, and especially he desires to be cautious about what he would say about the Lord. He's struggling. He's wondering about some things that we all wonder about. And, and he says, I'll guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. Now, for a while at least, he wanted to put a muzzle on his mouth. He doesn't want to say anything, particularly in the presence of the wicked that's going to cast aspersions on God, but he's struggling with these questions. It's not wrong to have questions, brethren. And it's not wrong to struggle. Sometimes people have those struggles and they feel guilty about it. And I, I, I'm going to tell you, when somebody close to me dies and I struggle, por qué? Why? Uh, and, and so, and some of those, I'll tell you another one, some of those questions are not going to be answered on this side. We're just going to have to trust the Lord to, to take care of what he said he would. In this psalmist bewilderment over what to do and say about his troubles, he's resolved he's going to weigh every word that he said for fear that his enemies might misunderstand him and twist his words and have him saying something he never said. They might charge him with believing and reporting a critical view of God's goodness. The fact that he's questioning these things doesn't mean that he doubts God's goodness, but he just, it's, it's perplexing. You know, I don't know why we have to have, well, I do too, intellectually, but in my heart I don't. You know, why, why do little children get sick? You know, why do people have healthy babies and beat them to death or starve them? And the things that you see constantly on the news, I just try to avoid as much of it as I can. 
But avoiding it doesn't change the fact that it's there and it's before us. And that we live in a culture that uh, would do those things. And so he doesn't, want to, he doesn't want to contribute to anybody attributing bad motivations or whatever to the Lord. And thus concerned that they might construe what he said as an, as an indication that he's dissatisfied with God, he just vows, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to sit over here and be quiet. In verse 2, his determination is so strong that he goes into silence and inactivity for a period of time. He said, I was mute and silent. I refrained even from good, and my sorrow grew worse. I mean, he just, he just withdrew. Sound like a depressed man, doesn't it? They can't drag himself out of bed, or woman. Men and women both get depressed. That's what he sounds like to me here. And he's, he's just completely shut down communications with others. He's even refused to speak about the good things, but that didn't help. Not only did it not help, his troubles got worse. So following carefully what he says, we're able to see his resolution. Verse 1, his fulfillment of that resolution. Verse 2, the effect and the fulfillment of his resolution on him. Uh, and that's verses 3 and 4. In spite of his determination to be silent, what happened? Well, it just welled up within him. It's just like lava. You know, and the pressure built, and the pressure built, and the pressure built, and he just couldn't contain himself. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. I was in Adamsville, Tennessee for about six and a half years before we moved here. And before I was there, uh, the, the preacher had caused a lot of problems and ended up having to dismiss him. So they had a, ended up having a congregational meeting. And this preacher and the elders walked into it because like one of them told me, he said, we've never been in a fight with a preacher before. We didn't know how, what to do. And so the erring brother had identified which elder was the strong man. It was going to be his biggest obstacle, and he realized he needed to get rid of him. And so they have this meeting. It is an ambush. It's a kangaroo court. And so they attack this brother, just viciously attack him. Well, our old elder, he was 90 years old at the time, got all that. I, his nephew told me about it, great nephew. Said Uncle Henry sat there and said his ears got red. I just looked at him from behind. He's a tall, handsome old gentleman, wore a little mustache, but he got up and walked in that pulpit. He, he wouldn't do it most of the time because he's got a bad hip. But he walked up there in the pulpit and took over. Took over the meeting. And uh, I'll never forget when I was there, we never had a peep because he he laid the wood to the brethren because they they bought that. Uh he could not tolerate any more of that mistreatment of a good godly man. And he was kin to most of the people in that room. And he told them that he'd never been more ashamed of a group of people in his life than he was of them in that moment. And said, I'm going to dismiss this, this proceeding and y'all are going to go home and think about this. And said, I can't call on any of you to lead prayer because none of you are in a position to lead prayer. And he led the prayer. Well, some of you have heard this story before, but it had a profound effect in that congregation because almost a whole bunch came forward Sunday night. And they dealt with that problem. And they never, in the six and a half years we were there, though nothing like that ever arose again. Of course, I wasn't out trying to tell the brethren how bad the elders are. You know, uh, uh, That didn't hurt. But Henry Carruthers, if you ever... Uh, We'll get on the other side you know, and meet him. Now, he was a good, good man. He was the grandfather of Dr. Tommy Alexander over at Harding. Any of you that might be a Harding graduate, uh, and I'm pretty sure helped Tommy get his terminal degree. Uh, that's just my guess. But uh, he was a great, good man. And But this man is decided he's going to be silent, and he finally, like Brother Henry, said, I spoke with my tongue. 
And uh, apparently he just muzzled himself to the fact that he didn't say a word. There it went. All right, we'll take up, Lord willing, see, the next time I'm here. <laughs>